Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for coming to an insight, an idea with Kumi Naidu, the executive director of Greenpeace International. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, the editor of Prospect magazine. We're going to have, I think, a very lively session. We're here to discuss, above all, uh, Kumi's ideas on climate change and particularly the ones uh, encapsulated in the a big report that Greenpeace is about to bring out in, uh, I think, a week's time. Kumi, would you like to hold it up uh, so that we can all see? And this is, the, the, this is uh, the big idea that Kumi is here to talk about. But as you know, these sessions are also to bring out a sense of where the thinkers' ideas have come from. And uh, Kumi has been at Greenpeace for just over three years. But I want to jump back, Kumi, to your life just before that. And, of course, you started off in South Africa as a very well-known anti-apartheid campaigner. And I wonder if you can just... Just sketch in for us those years of your life and how your thinking about uh, campaigning started then. Uh, I think uh, fair to say most of what I know now, and if I do have any skills and abilities, I learnt it from the anti-apartheid struggle. <laughs> I got involved at a very early age, at the age of 15. At 15. Yeah. 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 In fact, to be honest, one didn't understand the full complexities of what we were fighting. For example, the first march I led, we were chanting, we want equality in the front of the march. By the time the slogan got to the back of the march, the young people ch chanting, we want a color TV. <laughs> because kids in white schools had color TVs and we had no TVs. But anyway. Uh, it was a measure of a good So having got involved quite young, I was mainly a grassroots community organizer, youth organizer, was in the student movement, then joined Nelson Mandela's movement as an uh, underground activist. Uh, and then by the age of 22, I had to flee the country into exile because of persistent uh, repression. Uh, I was lucky I had a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford. Once I was done, I came back home a month after Mandela was released. Mm. Worked a, a month, I uh, worked for a year helping set up the ANC as a political party to contest the first democratic elections and in the process decided that working for the freedom struggle was one thing, working to capture formal political power, I didn't quite have the stomach for it. So I stayed out of politics and stayed out to strengthen civil society and headed up the South mm. African NGO coalition. Mm. And then the 10 years before Greenpeace, I was the head of Civicus World Alliance for Citizen Participation, mm. a global umbrella body that advocates for the interests of the non-profit mm. sector and civil society. Mm. Absolutely. And as I say, you took over in Greenpeace in, uh, I think, November 2009. What did you feel you wanted to do with Greenpeace when you, when you uh, took that big job? Well, obviously, I was wanting to go in to actually look at supporting Greenpeace in making certain changes that were already being considered. Such, such as what? The main ones are, one is campaigning together with people, right? Because the quite often people sort of give a small donation to Greenpeace and they say, okay, you folks go off and do the campaign. We are saying we need not just your money, we need your voice, your participation. And so increasingly now, in most of our campaigns, such as Save the Arctic, we've got like 2.5 million people around the world that have signed up and are participating and putting pressure on that campaign. The second thing is I wanted to work in alliance with others mainly within civil society in the first sense, to bridge the gap with the trade union movement. And it's great to hear the leader of the trade union movement say to Ban Ki-moon in a meeting we had at Rio, Secretary General, we as trade unionists support the fight against climate change because we recognize there are no jobs on a dead planet. Mm -hmm. And then also with the religious community. Every religious okay. text you pick up, there are gems of environmental wisdom in it. And sadly, I have to say, with the exceptions, of course, most of our religious leaders, silence has been deafening on speaking up for the environment and speaking up on, on climate change. That's an change. interesting point. We, we might come back to it. What, what the, when you took over at, at, at Greenpeace, what did you feel about direct action, which of course Greenpeace has a, a big history of, um, and, and about, about kind of civil resistance, if you like? Well, you know, if history teaches us one thing, that big change always seems inevitable when you start, uh, sorry, it seems impossible when you start and when you actually get to it, it seems, well, inevitable. Because as a young person fighting apartheid, always our parents told us, you'll never beat the regime, etc., etc. When we won, everybody thought, of course it was going to happen. And, but the other thing is that change only happens when decent men and women stand up and say, enough is enough and no more. We prepare to put our lives on the line, we prepare to go to prison if necessary, and we are prepared to engage in a whole range of other lobbying and dialogue and so on. But I think, uh, I'll give you a, a small anecdote about coming to Davos. The first time 
I came to Davos in my Greenpeace capacity as opposed to nine years before as a human rights and anti-poverty mm. and gender equality person. When I came in that capacity, I could never get any CEO to pre-arrange a meeting and sit down and have a conversation about a human rights situation in a country, for example. I'm not sure you're completely alone in that. Right. No, no, but now, the first, yeah. time, the first time I came as Greenpeace, yeah. yes. before I even arrived, uh, mm. uh, to the, uh, mm. there were so many requests from CEOs mm. My schedule was completely full. Ah, I couldn't even excellent. attend. And Sorry. and one of the no, CEOs, no, we're come on to well, time. let me just tell you, one of the CEOs said to me, well, Kumi, uh, I was late getting to him, and I said, I'm so sorry. And he said, no, I don't worry, I understand. I know all my colleagues are desperate to meet you. I said, why is that? And he said, well, we are desperate to get Greenpeace at the table because we hope that way we might not be on your menu of activism. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the bottom line is uh, yeah. Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Rosa Parks, all the big injustices and global challenges of our time. Those movements only move forward. That's how we defeated slavery. That's how we defeated colonialism. That's how we defeated apartheid. That's how we got the right of women to vote. Only when people said this is important enough that we are prepared to put our right. lives well, on the lines. And on, that's let's important. Let's go on to climate change then, because you've made this powerful case for it. And yet those are, are in many ways, more... The, the, those were not small goals. Of course. But they were defined ones, if you Correct. like. Climate change. Uh, it's a big one. Just, just if you can explain to us at the beginning, where does this fit in among Greenpeace's big uh, menu of, of of targets that it's campaigning on? Oh, it's number one, it's number one, one, number one, Fine. right? Uh, and so those people who still have an image of Greenpeace as small boats going after whaling fleets, this is they should be thinking climate change. Right? Oh, absolutely, but but to fight climate change, what does it mean? It means defending our forests because our forests actually uh, mm -hmm. capture and store carbon. You know, today we understand defending forests is not just because you like biodiversity, but because our forests collectively are the lungs of the planet. Mm. And without our forests, mm. humanity is there, with our oceans. So we are fighting on oceans and protecting our oceans and trying to get marine reserves, uh, you know, uh, declared. And, and where's the link to uh, climate change? The excess carbon in the atmosphere is ending up in the oceans, creating a problem called ocean acidification and essentially killing our oceans. Even not a radic most radical publication in the world, Newsweek, said six months ago that if we do not change track within four decades, 40 years, our oceans could be virtually dead. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing with climate change, that's the main push. Because as you correctly said, all the other struggles where individuals struggles that affected people in one country, or even if you say the woman's right to vote, it was one section of the... This year is about fundamentally our children and grandchildren's future. This is a, more important, I would argue, than all the other struggles actually combined. And therefore, when we see an acknowledgement by political and business leaders that we have to act on the one hand in words, but it's not matched by actions and deeds and policies and, and, and initiatives, then it's incumbent on those of us who care about the future of our children and grandchildren to mm -hmm. say this is a struggle that we must be willing to actually push and if needs be make sacrifices. I was hanging mm -hmm. off a Russian mm -hmm. oil rig in August last year. I tell you, it was, it was super cold uh, for the African going to the Arctic. We managed to stop, stop Gazprom uh, start drilling in, in, in the Russian Arctic. Uh, and those are the kinds of risks that I I'm seeing young people around the world willing to take, and I think those of us are in leadership must also step forward and show that it's important enough that we are willing to put our lives on the line as well. All right, and I've got, I mean, well, well it might, might sound flip, I have a question running in my mind, which, which is um, whether starting, tr starting by trying to persuade uh, the Russian government to give up fossil fuels drilling is, is, is the, best, the best target to start with. But I, I wonder if you could um, <laughs> um, just tell us a bit about this report, because this is going to lead us into uh, all, all kinds well, of questions. Well, we bring out this report called The Point of No Return. We looked at 14 big oil, coal, and gas projects. And this is which, right around the world. Uh, right around the world. Yeah. And of course, there are many, many more smaller ones, yeah. right? We didn't even look at that. But just mm -hmm. these 14, which includes <laughs> drilling in the Arctic, which includes... By, by which, which oh, country? Or company? By all companies, the ones... Any drilling in the Arctic. You're calling that one, one project? Yeah? Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Fine, yeah, yeah. Right. Of course, we're talking about the Greenlandic Arctic, the Russian Arctic, Russian, as, as right. well as the, the Canadian and, and, and uh, Alaskan Arctic, mm. where Shell is gung-ho moving forward there. Mm. But we managed to stop them last year, and we hope to do the same this year. Mm. Um, but um, then in Canada, we have the Tar Sands project, which is already 
causing huge devastation to the lives of the indigenous peoples that have lived there for centuries. It's already uh, completely changed Canada's standing in the world. It was one of the countries that spoke up for the environment in the past. Today it's one of the worst culprits. That's why they're not committing to a second commitment period in Kyoto. And then it's also given uh, courage to like Venezuela now, where, where Venezuela, this is the third project, they are talking about another massive uh, uh, tar sands project. The other big thing is in the US with shale gas. And I think more and more people are hearing this rather awful word called fracking, which is uh, hydraulic it's now fracturing. It's global vocabulary. For, yeah. and, and it's already impacting on water supply and, and so on. The, the madness about this is if there was political will, and, and the idea that I'm bringing to this conversation is that we need an energy revolution, perhaps the most important revolution humanity has actually seen, by doing two things by seriously investing in energy efficiency on the one hand and seriously in, uh, uh, investing in renewable energy possibilities right. on the other, we'll, we can actually get we'll, there. We'll, we'll, we'll come on to these things, but I just, I just love you just to run through the rest of the countries, really, also, ah. because I, I want you to get the word China in there. Ah, oh, okay, no, no, of course. Because it is on your list, isn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, so, so China is uh, massive on coal, as you know, uh, and, we'll and, know. and yeah. so we, Definitely, if so those what do you want five, China, the Chinese government to do? Well, we are saying that if these projects, all of them, go ahead, right? The impact, and by the way, this is we did it with the external research company called Ecosys, and they basically, I mean, this report basically says we have between now and 2020, where we have to ensure that the curve starts coming down from increasing emissions, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very short window. If these projects go ahead, and some of them will come to fruition over the next six years, we are guaranteed that our planet is heading to a four degree Celsius rise in temperature from pre-industrial levels. Uh, at the moment, it's been up to 0 0.8. The science says below 2%. Many of the small developing countries in the Pacific Island states and Caribbean and all are saying 1,5. This is the figure that was, 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 was used, um, for example, at Copenhagen yeah. and the discussions Correct. saying, look, we think it's our, our best, uh, scientists' best uh, guess that if, if we can hold temperature rises to below 2%, uh, yeah. it, it's, it's kind of livable in a straightforward way. And why we say point of no return, yeah. if all these 14 projects go ahead, yes. we're guaranteed a 4 degree World? You're put, you're, 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 I think even the scientists wouldn't, wouldn't put that um, wouldn't, wouldn't offer guarantees on it. But oh, we, I, well, <laughs> well, listen, up to now, mm. uh, the conversation has been these scientists, mm. you know, people were contesting the science and so on. Mm. Now the science is clear. It's only a few people in the fossil fuel industry that continue to actually argue against it. But it's not simply a question of what science is saying that should urge us to urgent action now. But it is what Mother Nature is saying to us through mm. the kinds of things we've seen just in the last three years. Forest fires and floods in places like Russia, China, United States. Um, the drought last year was the worst that we've seen. Highest uh, temperatures, Hurricane Sandy. And I mean, the list is much longer. Sadly, there are many more events happening in developing countries of a smaller scale. But because they're marginal places, we're not even hearing about hurricane. Bopa, or Typhoon Bopa in the Philippines last year because it was so fan, you know, horrifically uh, devastating the world found out. So a combination of these two things mm. tell us that it's not as if climate change impacts are going to happen somewhere in the world. A study commissioned by 20 governments has just said that now, this report shows, that we are losing about 5 million people annually as a result of climate impacts. And if things continue on this path by 2030, we'll be seeing the equi equivalent of 100 million lives lost annually if we don't actually uh, I, I've seen, I've, seen, I've seen that in your report, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to dive into those projections right now because it's a long and technical one. Uh, I, I'm, but I'm not by passing over that. I wouldn't want okay. you to think I completely agree. But okay. um, I, I think these are, these are debatable points. But I want, to, I want to get back onto what you would like governments to do. For example, the Chinese government. What would you like the Chinese government, which will say, look, we're trying to develop a very, what is still a very poor country or country with a lot of, sort of pockets of poverty. Uh, and actually, we're doing quite a lot. We put a cap on what we're going to, how much coal we're going to use by 2015. Um, and we're developing more, more nuclear and so on. What, what are you calling on, say, China to do? Well, I think uh, the language of the climate 
uh, negotiations is mm. one that talks about common and differentiated responsibilities, mm. which means that there are certain <laughs> things that all governments need to do. They need to have specific plans of moving away from the dependency on uh, carbon-based energy mm. sources and to actually uh, invest seriously in renewable energy and to also invest because uh, energy efficiency investment will actually save us. Serious energy mm. uh, efficiency investment will actually save us as much energy as these 14 projects will actually deliver is what the scientists tell us. Mm. And so that's what we say to all countries, whether it's the United States, whether it's China. However, because of the history of the problem, and while it is convenient for rich countries to actually negate the history of how the problem actually got to where it is, there has to be a leadership that we are seeing on the part of those countries, like the United States, that carry the biggest responsibility. Now, we are talking directly to the Chinese government, and we are saying to them exactly what I'm saying. I've just had a meeting with the chief climate negotiator, mm. uh, who is also the vice minister for planning, and anybody knows about how communist systems run. The dudes with the biggest attitudes are the guys who are in the Ministry of Planning. So this is a really seriously powerful guy, and he's saying, we are ready to move, but the difficulty is, how do they give up a competitive edge when the countries that carry the biggest responsibility for the accumulation of carbon over the last centuries continue to actually be moving in the other direction because some of these projects uh, are being uh, driven by the United States, Australia, mm -hmm. Canada, and, and a few successor states mm -hmm. of the former Soviet mm -hmm. Union. <coughs> Let's take the United States one and the uh, fracking, um, uh, which isn't only in the United States, sure. um, there's some in Britain too. But, Using some uh, uh, mini uh, earthquakes uh, in your country as a result of it, I'm told. They have been uh, fairly small. But, yeah. um, uh, but uh, let's just take the United States example, because um, as you know, many US officials would argue, look, fracking is actually a way for us to bring down emissions, at least compared to where they were, because it's switching us to gas. All right, that's still a fossil fuel, but it's an improvement. Uh, on where we, we are. Uh, and by the way, U.S. emissions have fallen in the past few years, partly because of financial, uh, financial, prices. financial crisis and so on. So uh, what, what do you say to the argument that, look, fracking is, uh, perhaps you understand it's not, not perfect, but it's actually offering an improvement on actually, where the U.S. is now? Actually, th there's a little bit of a nuance here. Hmm. Uh, often, no, if, if, no, no, yeah, often, even environmentalists in many parts of the world, hmm. including some within Greenpeace, I should say, hmm. have said, that natural gas could be a, a transitional fuel mm, mm, to, mm. however, how you access natural gas is a range of different ways. And hydraulic fracturing, which is one of the, uh, fracking, mm. is one of the most risky in terms of contaminating our water supply, mm. methane gas uh, release, all of which there's ample evidence that we are seeing now in the United States. Mm, mm. And therefore, the overall e environmental consequences of it doesn't justify it. But on the other hand, the United States, as President Obama said in his inaugural address, mm. that the United States is seriously undermining its long-term economic potential. Because let's be very clear, the competitive countries and companies of the future will not be those that win the arms race, the space race, or any other race. The competitive countries and companies of the future will be those that get as far ahead of the green race now. The United States at one stage could have been a leader in solar. Right? There was positive developments and then with no government leadership and so on. But the question always gets asked, well, if it's in the U.S. economic interest, then why does the U.S. political leadership not go there? And I want to say something that's kind of controversial. I think the sad reality is today the United States is the best democracy that money can buy. And when you interrogate that money, it's highly fossil fuel based money. For every member of Congress, there's a minimum of three full time lobbyists that is paid by the fossil fuel industry to ensure that uh, progressive climate legis legislation doesn't go and add and then up to, if you come from a very powerful fossil fuel state, the fossil fuel industry is putting about eight full-time lobbyists. So we have to understand that the reason why this clear big challenge that threatens humanity's very existence on, on this planet is not moving forward is because those companies who are currently benefiting at a massive level are putting short-term interests before 
the long-term interests of our children, but also the long-term interests of their very companies, I would argue, because in fact it's not in the interests of their company sustainability if they create a situation where there's massive conflict, climate refugees, uh, countries disappearing under small island states and all disappearing under the ocean. This is not in the interest of business. So I would argue it's well, short-sightedness on the part of business not to act and to block government uh, taking leadership on it. Well, we, we, we could go over that point because obviously um, they would argue that in the short to medium term it is actually bringing down some of the, some of the costs and the emissions of the United States. But I wonder if we could um, switch to what, uh, to what you're saying now about, uh, about nuclear. What kind of argument have you made in this report on that? Because obviously people have come back uh, a lot at Greenpeace and other climate campaigners and said surely nu nuclear g granted all kinds of problems about, about dealing with the waste but still, if you're saying that climate change is the number one priority, then surely nuclear must have a, a place. Okay. So, on the one end, we have more than 40 think tanks that we've been working with, business organizations and so on, in what we've called the Energy Revolution Initiative, that tell us that by 2050, we can ensure that this planet is almost 95% completely non-reliant on either nuclear or oil, coal, and gas, if we start investing on the scale. And by the way, just in the last year, in, 20, uh, in 2011, we saw a 30% increase on uh, renewable energy expansion, right? Mm -hmm. even without the enabling environment for the industries to actually uh, move forward. So in the light of that, why would humanity want to take the risk with nuclear, which is too expensive, too dangerous, and as a solution to climate change after Fukushima, right, will deliver too little too late. Because I can tell you that all the nuclear projects that are being talking about now, as a result of Fukushima, the safety considerations, even some of the international protocols that will come into place now, will take about 10 to 15 years before they even see the light of day. But as you correctly said, assuming the nuclear industry were able to look all of us in the eye and say, folks, we can guarantee there'll never be a terrorist attack on a nuclear facility. We can guarantee that not one single worker will, will, will make an error. We can guarantee that there will never be any technical failing. Let's assume we accepted all of that. But the nuclear industry cannot look us in the eye and say to us, we have a safe solution for the storing of, storing of dangerous uh, nuclear waste at the end of the cycle. And the image that people should have is when archaeologists today go out and excavate, they find, you know, towns, artifacts, temples, and so on that our ancestors left for us. The archaeologists of the future, because it takes hun uh, hundreds of years, sometimes up to thousands of years before the nuclear waste actually is safe, the archaeologists of the future, what we will be giving to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren is the most toxic, poisonous waste that we will be bearing, and already in places like Germany, it has had an impact on uh, impacting on, on, yeah, people on water. People might say to you, look, that is, that is local. That, that is at least a manageable threat compared to trying to manipulate the atmosphere, which, which, is, which is far more difficult. See, if I'm a sensible person, Greenpeace is a sensible organization, most environmentalists understand we need to make uh, you know, uh, trade-offs. Hmm. However, why should we make such a dangerous trade-off when our governments and our business uh, business leaders continue to s say the right thing, we must act, we must act, we must act, and then their practice is foot dragging all the time and they are suffering from a bad case of cognitive dissonance where all the uh, facts are saying you have to change and then, you know, for a few moments when we are talking to them, and that's a difficulty for my work, when I talk to heads of state, ministers of environment and all, you know, conversations around the boardrooms, there's no disagreement. But once we walk out, to, with exceptions, it's mainly a business as usual approach. So if a business, a business, business as usual. usual. So, so, so you know, if our governments and business leaders maximize all the potential that there is in all the different forms of renewable energy and energy efficiency, and then said, ah, oh, look, you know, we still have a, we mm. still have a shortage of supply. That's a different conversation. We mm. should not compromise now when in fact mm. the reason we stick to these dirty, dangerous energies is because it serves the interests of a handful of people who make huge amounts of profit and does not serve the public purpose that it should ultimately do. That, that makes it seem almost a simple argument to, to change, that if you changed a handful of, 
of, of, of, of, of companies or a handful of governments you'd, you, you'd answer the problem. I want to get... No, I'm not saying handful, I'm saying it's... A... Right, I want to get more into what kind of argument you think you're having. I mean, going back to one of the points I made at the beginning, um, this is a huge target. You're talking about companies, you're talking about most of the governments of the world. It is different from arguing for, um, say, civil rights in, 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 in South Africa. Do you think there is still a possibility of a global deal on climate change? Or do you think really that died with Copenhagen and what we're talking about now is lots of individual efforts? What, what are you arguing for? A global deal? Or are you really, do you really think your best hope is at the government or company? I, I think we need to do both. I don't think we can get away without a global deal. I mean, we're talking here about something bigger than the Industrial Revolution potentially. That's what we are talking about in terms of a change in thinking about a uh, our, our economy. I've just come from a meeting with somebody who's in the leadership of the uh, IT sector. And talking to her, the plans they have, the things they're doing, yes, somebody who gets it, that we have to actually make these changes and they are doing things. I'm not going to stop doing that and just hold out for the big prize of the fair, ambitious and binding treaty, which we called in Copenhagen, we said we wanted a fab deal, and we jokingly say what we got was a flab deal full of loopholes and bull. Uh, but the reality is it's back on the cards now for 2015. No, it's the, right? power, the, yeah, the talks it, that may happen in yeah. Paris. Yeah. And, and, and I think President Obama's comments at his inaugural uh, um, speech, and I know everybody's saying, you know, politicians say many things and don't deliver. Well, but, you're saying that. Uh, no, no. Yeah, oh, well, most people say that. Um, uh, the reality, I mean, that's part of the problem. What I think our political don't, leaders don't understand is that apart from everything that's health is, that is happening, there's a growing and growing gap between political leadership and business leadership on the one end and ordinary citizens on the other. That gap is growing and that's not good for democracy. It's not good for peace. It's not good for stability. And, but what he said, and I read it about five times and I listened to it about ten times, there is something in it that actually says that perhaps he will use some of his capital now, like he didn't do in his first term, to push the agenda mm. forward. I can tell you something. Mm. Well, in, in China, yeah. we, we will win in China very easily if the U.S. stepped forward and said, not one more cent is going to go into any new fossil fuel projects. We're going to invest in what we would like to see Wait, China and the U.S. Yes. China and the U.S. partnering and making some joint investments and other big economic players and making some serious investment in thoughtful research and innovation that can power a new industry that creates millions of... By the way, the well, potential well, of job the, creation is much the more... the US and China to act together yeah. on a lot of things. It would solve a lot of problems. But um, I just want to come back, um, drawing um, gently towards the end. I, I'd like to come back to the, the 14 projects you've got here. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I'd like to understand more about what are you, what are you calling for in this report? Are you calling for these 14 projects not to happen? Yes. And therefore, have you said what you think should happen instead in these countries? Yes, it's yeah. not right. rocket science. So yeah. two, two sentences. We're saying if they go ahead, yeah. it's a point of new return. Yeah. It shouldn't go ahead, and that same amount of resources, right, or maybe less even, should be redirected to really ramp up their investment in investing in renewable sources that exist in all of these different places where these projects are But that are being might not give them as much energy. Uh, in terms of, well, listen, the scientists that worked on this report say that if we engage in just not renewable energy generation, but just in energy efficiency measures, the amount of energy that would save would be equivalent to what energy these 14 projects will, will generate. Mm -hmm. And there are many uh, statistics, like in mm -hmm. Gazprom, mm -hmm. what the, uh, the Russian project in the Arctic that we succeeded in stopping last year, the amount of oil that Gazprom is spilling on land annually is more than what that project, if it were to be successful. So why we continually to mindlessly uh, threaten uh, the integrity of the planet? And let's just be clear, the Arctic is different from all the other projects. With the Arctic mm. is a refrigerator and air conditioner <laughs> yeah. of the planet. And uh, as the scientists have been saying, what happened in Hurricane Sandy and so on, we hit the lowest level of Arctic sea ice in the summer months mm. last year. And if we see further erosion of the Arctic sea ice, then what is, in fact, you know, your refrigerator, air conditioner, the planet is gone. Mm. The scientists then are not clear yeah. exactly what the impacts are, other than saying 
that the impacts would be devastating. Let me just ask you on that point, because you've mentioned scientists a lot, and Greenpeace has a lot of very committed scientists working with it, or others you, whose research you draw on. But I haven't heard you today use the word economist, and Greenpeace is not known for oh. its banks of economists, and it's rather re relevant at uh, yeah, absolutely. this. So just absolutely. finally, this is a last, Thank you. last, la last Thank question. You. What do you say to the governments of poor countries who say, look, this stuff is too expensive? Well, the economists that have spoken just in the last three months Joseph Stiglitz said, if we don't act now, the cost to the global economy, Nobel Peace yeah. uh, Economics, will, will be devastating. P, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, in a study, uh, says that we are going to hit a five-degree world if we don't yeah. act now. You like one more economist, then we have to stop. Uh, right. The World Bank. Fine. The World Bank said we're on a four-degree world. So Okay. We're, we're actually sadly going to have to stop. Um, but thank you, Kamini Thank you very much. And the rest of you, thank you very much indeed for coming this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry for that abrupt stuff no, no, no. for you.